magical land of fairy tales, there was a princess who lived freely, unbound by societal rules around her. When asked why she kidnapped a long-haired robot for experimentation, she answered calmly. For the third season in a row, Tensei Ojo to Tensei Nejo no Maho Kakume continues the trend of Yuri being my favorite anime of the season. On the surface, it's just another generic RPG world with a 10 kilometer long name and literally has Tensei reincarnated in the title. So by all metrics, it should be trash. It literally filled the holy trinity of garbage. But it's so charming. From the very first episode, it had me absolutely hooked, brimming with excitement. So today, I'd like to introduce this beautiful world to you. And no, it's not just because of the Yuri. I'm not a Yuri fan, okay? All my favorite anime just happen to have Yuri in them. I swear, Ten Ten, look, it's the short form in Japanese, I'm calling it that. Blame the Japanese if you don't like it. <clears throat> Tenten introduces a story with a batshit crazy princess with no magic and a divorced wife. Divorce. <laughs> I call the princess crazy because God gave her two brain cells and she used both to answer the question, do I want to do it, instead of should I do it. Because Princess Anis is a royalty born without the natural ability to use magic, she instead devotes her time to the study of magicology, the use of magic in various equipment, birthing various tools similar to what we have in the modern world, such as a kettle, a lamp, and the broom that your Asian mom uses to smack the shit out of you, except it has an auto function. It's like the Industrial Revolution, except it's one person and not a whole ass country. Life gave Anis the middle finger, so Anis kindly returned the middle finger by refusing to act like royalty, living like a free spirit, doing whatever she wants. On the other side of the spectrum, we have the prim and proper noble lady who lives her life on a Google calendar with 15 schedules a day. Noble Euphelia is arranged to politically marry the crown prince, aka Anis' brother, but he pulls a jasmine and goes all, I will choose my fate and marry whoever I want to. Except he turned into Karen Jasmine and publicly shunned Euphelia with false accusations of bullying, harassment, and planned assassination. And then... I came in like a rainbow! Anis then kidnaps Euphelia with consent. I think. Okay, maybe not, but it's post-consent. And takes off into the starry sky, starting the growth and daily life of two lesbians. So you may ask, what is so intriguing about magic and royalty clusterfucks? It still sounds like generic isekai stuff, but gay. And my answer would be two words. Characters and world. The main character in particular, Anis, is so charming. Her bubbly personality and free chaotic spirit is just a blast to watch. She literally commits plane crashes on a daily basis. This is backed up by incredible voice acting with unique intonations that almost make her sound like she's trolling half the time. Euphelia gets her obligatory white-haired oh, isekai girl PTSD implanted in her from episode 1 and starts questioning her life. She's been following an instruction manual her entire life and now you're gonna tell her, LOL live slice of life, as if she doesn't feel like the failure for allowing this to happen in the first place? Of course she's gonna feel lost with her life. Who doesn't feel lost researching in the laboratory? <sighs> Fuck my life. After Walmart Flynn commits slander, you start to see the true colors and direction of the story. Character building. This anime is not afraid to let you sit there watching Euphelia ponder her existence and have an existential crisis for 10 minutes. If you came here for flashy monster murder, then you came to the wrong place. The initial direction being taken here is Anis showing the uptight Euphelia how to live freely, and this is done slowly. We get to see the small everyday things like testing out new magicology weapons, drinking tea, and before sleep sex. There is no rush to show anything action because the focus here is to show how Euphelia gets accustomed to her new life, dealing with trauma of the incident. It's a character-driven anime, an anime that shows the gradual change of a character under the influence of another, how her life perspective changes and their relationship grows deeper over time. Anis and Euphelia's relationship has been building up amazingly. I mean, from being kidnapped to I can show you to to dying on Euphelia's lap. Holy shit, the Stockholm Syndrome is strong! Is this what kidnapping does to people? I really look forward to seeing how this relationship grows and eventually blossoms as a genuine relationship with depth over time. Well, at least that's what me at episode 3 thinks slash hopes will happen. 
I love the characters. Anis is a lovable dork face. Euphelia is so cute. Whatever the fuck her name is, she was ripped straight out of Pokemon XY. And man, the dads are bros, unlike a lot of anime with freedom as the theme. One of them might have 15 artilleries on the verge of popping, but they're still bros, trying their best to be understanding parents. Raising children always comes at the cost of heart attacks, am I right? The other word I mentioned just now is world, because there is also a good deal of emphasis on world building. Because of the shitstorm caused by Beta Pain's will to live freely and desire to marry a commoner, declaring it like a 5 year old wanting candy, we have a political royal mess. We see how the king and Euphelia's dad have to deal with the public issue aftermaths of the events. Then we have Magicology. Anis's NASA level research said to have potential to cause a noble uprising because only noble blood can use magic. So magic tools fucks up their privilege. Fuck the ri- Just like with its characters, the anime is not afraid to slowly reveal the world's mechanics, build background tensions, and introduce the overarching drama. It doesn't have to suddenly climax in three episodes, it's taking its time to give us a very good feel for the whole world. In a way, this reminds me of the beginning episodes of Mushoku Tensei, where they just kinda show Rudy's childhood, introducing the magic mechanics and Rudy's relationship with his family and Roxy. Nothing really happens, it's just a kid fucking around in his childhood, but that's the magic of good world building. It manages to create this immersive world that makes you care about all the little details and mechanics, and after a while, you're obsessing over the physics of how a bee can fly in a fake world more than a real world. I felt a similar immersion in this anime. I actively look forward to seeing what magicology can do, how the overarching and future conflicts come into play, and how this blonde bitch bastard eventually pisses himself on a stage. It's not even just the world that's incredible, it's the atmosphere itself. Yes, I'm praising air, okay? I too love air. Air is love. Air is life. Literally. When something happens, you feel it. Kinda like how you can feel something is off if your girlfriend is secretly pissed off at you and is giving you the cold shoulder. Not that I would know the feeling. During this shitstorm full of blonde baby shit, you can really feel the desperation, the panic, the hopelessness in Euphelia as she is openly embarrassed. Yes, credit goes to the amazing voice acting, but it also has to do with the atmosphere. How they show Euphelia go from strongly resisting, to speechless, to breaking down. The glaring, judging audience, the shouting from knock-off Elite Four Gordon Ramsay. Donkey. You can just feel the panic, the absolute blank state of, what the fuck is going on, is my life over? moment in Euphelia. The chaotic sense of panic is so well done. In a similar fashion, you can really feel the melancholy in episode 3. The way Euphelia goes through her strangely lax daily tasks, trying to put on a mask to look like she's okay but still completely lost on the inside. The sad smiling expressions, the way she reacts to others who try to sympathize, the gorgeous soundtrack. Everything just comes together to form the image of a lost girl. No, the emotion is not simply sad, it's not a single powerful climactic scene of someone breaking down crying, it's emptiness that's being conveyed. The emptiness a human feels blaming herself for her faults, a void of nothing. And everything in the anime does a fantastic job at building up the atmosphere to make it feel this way. This is what I've been truly loving so far. They're taking their time to properly build an atmosphere around the characters and they feel alive. Particularly the previously mentioned lost, trapped Euphelia, and the high energy joy and smiles the batshit crazy Anis brings. It really gets me immersed in this fantasy world, so I really hope they continue this trend of not rushing and truly building up not just the world, but also the characters. Alright, look, I know there's something I need to address. You think I'm suspicious. Why hasn't this motherfucker brought up Licorice Recoil yet? It's practically written all over the anime! Like, come on! Nicolas Cage causing swimming pool drownings was a less obvious correlation. And... Usually I'm joking when I say, It's like Licorice Recoil! But holy shit, it's like Licorice Recoil! It's not just the gayness, it's literally all the way down to the characters and story structure. Think about it. Freedom girl who rejects a larger organization and goes do her own thing. Stoic serious girl who always goes by the book, gets fucked over by misunderstandings slash false accusations, and gets yeeted to Genki girl's place. Genki girl then teaches serious girl how to live freely. The entire fucking structure is the same. And then we have Anis. Yeah, you can tell I avoided blowing up fanboy early on, but come on, come on, come on. 
Look at this. She's literally Chisato. Even the fucking amazing voice acting sounds like the incredibly fun sounding Chisato voice acting. It's literally the exact same charm Chisato had. When she's on screen, the show is always entertaining. The fucking things I'm saying are literally almost identical to my Licorice Recoil video. She's literally Isekai Chisato. I'm not calling plagiarism because, well, the whole political situation and world being built up is different, and technically the source came out before Licorice Recoil, so this would be Project File Licorice Recoil dot Final Test Edition? Nah, who cares? If you simp a girl with your heart, then simp her sister counterpart. Tenden is an anime that holds insane resemblance to one of my favorite anime of all time, so naturally I'd be insanely hooked and maybe biased from the beginning. From the air characters and gay meter overload, watching every episode puts me in existential fanboy mode. They literally took the 99% gayness level in Licorice Recoil and made it 200%. Anna's flirting jeans puts Chisato flirting jeans to shame. Wait, they're orphans. I've praised the hell out of Tenten, but I wouldn't call it a masterpiece just yet. Nothing big has happened yet, and the story is only just getting started, but for what we have, it's an extremely engaging and promising start to a hopefully fully fleshed out story. I can't wait to see where this show takes us next. God, I'm excited for Gay French Revolution!